Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about aliasing variables. We've spoken about variables so far quite a lot and we have created lots of them. Colors specifically, but we've created a bunch of them. What we don't have at the moment is a strong alias structure. And what that means is that these variables here in our semantic collection, because they're named by purpose, don't have a reference. These should probably not be raw hex values here. They should be referencing another variable somewhere else. The first thing we're going to do is create a new collection. I'm just going to call this primitive for now. And within here, we'll start creating variables, which will ultimately be aliased or referenced in these ones. I've created a little map of the current variables that we have. So we have this color pairing that we are recognizing from the previous sessions. I've added in the hex values underneath just to make it a little bit clearer what they're actually doing. On the left hand side, we have a swatch map effectively. Within here, I've taken each of the variable circles or swatches and tried to match them or try to split them into different groups. You'll see at the top, we have a mono section, then green, yellow, blue, purple, red, and pink. There's also some labels at the top just to help me identify whether these are light mode or dark mode variables that need to be created. You'll notice straight away, we have lots of very similar colors, specifically in the mono section. But if I go down to pink as well, you'll see these two in particular look very similar. The hex values are pretty aligned as well, but they're being used in different places. When you start to create your variables in your designs retrospectively, you'll start to notice common threads. So if I zoom in up here, you'll see this pill or lozenge is a very similar color to the action. And when you're starting to create the variables, you might end up actually consolidating variables to do that. If I look at the pink ones in particular again, these two could probably be the same variable. That's where your design decisions need to be decided again. You might not want to split them, or you might want to split them. Entirely up to you when you're creating your systems. For the mono examples, this brings us a good distinction of what we want to do for our structure. At Figma, we have a different primitive structure for light and dark mode. So if I just start creating some, I'll show you what I mean. Jump back to the primitive selection and create a color variable. If we create one for the mono to make this panel a little bit smaller, and take our mono palette or ramp, if you like. Let's create one. So if I say mono 100 is indeed that white here. Mono 200 might be taking this light gray here. Mono 300 might be slightly darker again and take the third option. This one is the dark mode version though. At Figma, what we do is we have something like this. So mono 100 light, mono 200 light. Then what you might end up having is mono 100 light, uh, dark. And you sample that dark. So you have a light 100 and a dark 100. This is entirely up to you how you want to structure these. This could all be one mono range, or it could be split between the light and the dark mode variations. As I said before, you may actually want to consolidate some of these variables if they are very similar in their hex values. These two, for example, the light and dark for this one could actually be the same. So what I'm going to do for now is just strip this down and keep it simple. Have a simple 100, 200, 300 plus range. So I'll create another one and call this 400 and sample the fourth in the, in the list. Another one, 500, sample the fifth. And then we go down and down and down. That was actually the wrong one there. So that's this one. You can see how hard it is to keep track when you have lots of very similar variables. So now we need to go to this one. You can see how similar they are in there, 700. And you can basically go up in 100s as we need to. The reason we use hundreds is because let's say, for example, you needed to create one that was in between the these two. Let me close this panel. You might need one that's in between this white and in between this gray, for example, a page background. 
If I jump to the HSL options here, you can see this is 97 in lightness. If I wanted to be 99, for example, and get the hex value of FC, 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 this would sit in between my white and my very light gray. In which case, we may end up creating a mono 50. Oh, sorry, 150. Mono 150, which sits in between. So that gives you that flexibility. In between 100 and 200, you get another 10 plus variations that you can add if you need to. Let's just delete these. Now we're going to create the rest. So we need to create a mono. Uh, mono variations are done. We need to create a green 100, which would take in our green here. This may not end up being 100. As you can see, that's quite dark. It might be a 200 or a 300, but we only have two greens. So in this instance, I'm just going to call them 100 and 200. The names of these primitives are flexible. They can be changed later if you need to. Then we do the same for the yellow. Because these are primitives, they will ultimately not be made available to all the designers on the team. So the naming convention is something you just need to be comfortable with from a systems perspective. I probably wouldn't call this yellow 100 and 200 in, in reality, but because they're, they're hidden from view, they can be as flexible as we need to be. Blue and blue. And then I'll actually refactor these in a moment. We need to go purple, purple, just sample them so we have them to reference. 200 there, and red. And then finally, we have the pink, which actually has for four. So we have pink 100, pink 200, pink 300, which is, as I said before, very similar to the 200. So this is where you might end up actually changing this. Pink 400, which matches that dark one. Typically, we see teams either going from 100 to 500, or maybe 100 to 700, or 100 to 900, depending on how many different variations of color you need. The likelihood is that you probably only need a couple, but this naming convention does allow you to do that. Now, let's jump over to our semantic collection, or the color collection, and start to apply them. So this F8, F8, F8 is actually coming from a mono. So this is the mono 200, this 21, one F1C, I believe is coming from this last one, 700. And then we can basically go through and map all these up. So you'll see we're now aliasing each and every single one. This is a 600 because there's a six on the list. The action color, and this is where things get a little bit tricky, is because we have very similar pinks. So if I scroll down, scroll down in my map, this is FE9, which is actually the 200 there. This is the 400 because the darkest one of the pink. And we go down each and every single one of these. As you can see, they've now been aliased, which means they have a reference to that primitive collection. So jumping back to color, mono 200 matches the primitive mono 200 here. Jumping back again, if we wanted to change the name of these, we can do that if we want. To back to the primitive, go down to pink 200. If this ended up being something like pink 150, that is now referenced in here, where the name's been updated. So that's how you work with aliasing when you start to think about your components. When you're applying components, it's exactly the same as before. So if I select something in here, background page is exactly the same semantic variable we would be applying we wouldn't be applying those primitive ones. And to make that happen, we can actually de-scope them, which means make them not available. 
head back to the primitives and select all of them. So select one, scroll down, hold shift and select them all. If you now right click, you can edit variables and I want to remove these from being picked in anything on the canvas. So if I uncheck this, that unchecks them. Hide this down. If I now create a shape on the canvas, open up my picker, you'll see that none of those primitive values are surfacing. It's only the semantic ones which are referencing those aliases. So if we do apply background action, head back to my color, background action is pulling in pink 150. If I change that value, so background action maybe becomes purple 100, that changes on the canvas. You can also see it's changed in my component. Maybe it goes to green, maybe it goes to yellow. You can start to see the cascade across your entire product when you start to use those aliases. So this is why the semantic version is really important because background action, we don't need to know what the color is. We just need to know that we are applying this on the canvas. The color can be controlled from the design system and we can make sure that any color we do ultimately use is then pushed through to our components. I won't bore you by adding all the rest of these aliases. I'll make sure those are done in the next video, which I'll see you in very soon.